in this first segment in studio, uh, by the way, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day out there. I notice you haven't come empty handed. No, I haven't. I got the word that food is welcome and it puts a smile on everybody's face. So I've got tasty cake pecan swirls, tasty cake lemon blueberry dipping sticks, and Mm -hmm. some chocolate. Nothing better eight in the morning than some good old chocolate dipping sticks. So I'm warned. I was warned not to put anywhere close to you because, as a way of disappearing <laughs> now, quickly. Now let me just say that that, that was Sweet Tooth Stubblefield, but uh, <laughs> telling well, lies again. But uh, I've learned from experience, Rob. Uh-huh. I've learned from experience. I look at them, I admire them, I salivate over, but I never taste them because they're all on Rob's end of the table. No, I keep them at my end of the table so you don't eat them during the show, because there's no worse sound than someone chewing into a microphone. I think it's important to note that Rob's eight in the morning. Morning is everybody else's three in the afternoon. <laughs> That's true. So, the alarm goes off at three a.m. in this house here. So, oh, I would hate that. I, I am getting up in the morning. Is I'm not a morning person. I was discussing it with some of my staff this morning. I'd rather stay up late. Oddly enough, I'm the same way. However, but you still have <laughs> the, the to, job yeah. description that calls for something else. But hey, uh, before we do it, yeah. I, I you, the schedule you keep has to be. Backbreaking. You're, you're, oh, it is, Bill. I do a lot around I know, no, here. We're, yeah, talking about the, we're talking about the good senator now. But you're so, you look, come in, you're so fresh looking. You're so invigorated. Now, are we still talking to Shelley or me? <laughs> no, okay. we're talking to the, yeah, to the senator. Sure. Yeah. We forgot, we get drifted away from you several minutes ago, Rob. My apologies. <laughs> Continue, please, sir. Okay. No, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed, uh, Senator. Well, Howell. I'll take that yeah, as a yeah, compliment. Yeah. Thank you. It's meant as a compliment. I'm yeah. going to say, yeah. I look in the mirror and go, woo. No, no, <laughs> late, not at all. late night last night. Night. but uh no i i try to keep it yeah. keep it in the lanes yeah. hey let's uh start with the uh the biggest issue right now that's uh, the looming government shutdown mm-hmm. and the latest progress you've heard on this is we seem to do this every so many years this is a road to nowhere i am really concerned about this i mean i am an optimistic person who always thinks that we can negotiate and figure out a way to uh uh hit the hard issues and and find some kind of compromise but in this case after what i've seen is going on in the house yesterday they just uh, rejected a rule on the department of defense appropriations that's that you know just on the face of it it doesn't sound like well uh, a lot but these are usually leadership votes these are usually partisan votes that whoever the party in 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 power is usually wins that vote that rule vote and they lost it they've lost it three times in a row I'm um, very discouraged. I think that um, there's no, you know, the leverage that the House thinks that they have. They have to remember there's a Democrat Senate and a Democrat president. And at some point, if you cut uh, and and have un- unreasonable demands on, on certain bills, they're just not going to get through. And and so uh, right now, I think it's a it's a tied up a lot in the speakership and. Uh, wanting to rein in spending, which we all want to do and have shown that we can do through this appropriations process. So I'm very discouraged, and I think we are heading for a government shutdown, which is concern for veterans and Social Security and people going to national parks and all other kinds of things. The stalemate that delayed us to this point called for reduced spending. What were the details of that reduced spending? The details of that were that from year to year, from uh, 2023, which we're coming out of the close of this year, uh, into the 2024 budget, that we would spend less money. And they struck an agreement between the Speaker and and President Biden. But the House came in and marked their bills much lower. They didn't mark to the agreed amount. I'm on appropriations in the Senate. We marked to the agreed amount, uh, which is a cut. And it's spending less. It's not, you know, it's not going to earth shake the world how much less, but it is a, it is a, um, a significant portion. And we passed all 12 bills out of our committees. We're going to have them on the floor uh, in the Senate. And uh, for some reason, the House is just slashing and slashing. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's leading to a lot of frustration, I think. So I think in order to make the point even tougher and harder i think the house wants to shut it down and and hope they think put enough pain on the president and on the senate to to accede to their position but i i can't see how that happens when those seats are held by the opposite party the majorities are there is a shutdown as this Mm -hmm. now seems like a when there is a shutdown uh scenario 
Uh, those who receive payment from the federal government will not so right. will does that mean social security checks do not go out well i think that that is a possibility uh the last significant shutdown we had was 2013 and that went on for i believe 15 to 16 days and that was the one where they boarded up the national parks where they uh, uh a lot of people received their checks late or didn't receive them at all so it, it, it can really throw a major wrench into the system and it's very painful for people and that nobody understands it because they send us to washington to do our jobs it's just a misery march is what i call it so at that point anybody federal pensioners they don't receive their checks either correct? i think initially they do because some of those are paid in arrears so you would you would say uh, get a check and on i'll pick a date october 1st that would be for september so you're still going to get that check but if it goes on much longer than that then you, don't. Uh, then you become uh, it becomes uh precarious we have the irs here so there are federal employees in our right. backyard if it went on long enough they would not get paid that's correct do you folks get paid during a shutdown does your staff get paid uh no they don't uh and i'm not sure i think i think the senate does get paid <laughs> how ironic is that uh because of um, anomalies that written that required that we are paid, but I, I don't know. I have to go back and check on that. that. That's not any motivating factor for any of this. I think it's just our staffs do not get paid. The house, do the house no. uh, members get paid. I, that I don't know. I think so. I think so. But their staffs don't get paid. They're they're driving the shutdown. They shouldn't get paid at all if there's no reason why house members there's should get some, paid if they're driving the there shutdown. used to be some bills that where you would and I could support this where if you go into a shutdown you you give up any pay and you don't get back pay a, a lot of our staffs would get back pay they would get mm -hmm. made whole uh in the end because that's what's happened in, in 2013 but it it's just a, a bad tactic uh a lot of the guy, uh, the guys over there who are driving this forward men and women have never lived through something like this and uh we did in 2013 and it's it's miserable for the american people Actually, I believe it's 2018 in the 34 days that, that they were shut down. Right. That was just a single. That was the yeah. Trump shutdown, yes, which, and it was Homeland Security. Yeah. It was just one bill. This is full all, government. All them, yeah. That's a bit of a distinction. And they, uh, they have the government employees of two categories. There are the critical and non-critical mm -hmm. during the shutdown. The non-critical do not work at all, but, but they will. But there's a statute that says they'll be paid when the shutdown's over. Right. The critical have to continue to work, but they don't get paid either. I know. My Correct. wife's one of yeah, those. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so in that case, if you're a government employee, you just soon be a non-critical because you're going to get paid just like the critical folks will but you don't have to go into work right you designate your staff yeah. one way or the other when the dust settles on this do you think um, uh, speaker McCarthy's seat is in jeopardy I do I think that uh, you can see the underpinnings of that uh, Kevin's a good friend of mine I served with him for a long time over on the house he is in a really difficult position you can see him uh, maneuvering to try to find that fine line to to get a majority vote uh, and he's he's really these last ones have got to be devastating to him, and I think they're threatening to bring the vote forward to uh, uh, displace him as a speaker. But I, I don't know that they have a replacement. You know, the, the, the sad thing about this for me is, I mean, I'm a good, solid Republican. We have the House. We have the ability to really forge policy. We saw that when we did the um, Fiscal Responsibility Act in, in March, where we put down numbers that are less spending. We're going to lose our leverage here, or whatever leverage we might have. But I do think Kevin is going to have a challenge. Going back to that uh, heir apparent, the one that people frequently say is Steve Scalise from Louisiana, but he's a sick man. And um, so question whether or not he would even want to try to do that. Steve's had a rough, uh, rough go here. He was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's in treatment right now. Uh, he's a relatively young guy. He's also the uh, the guy that was shot in mm -hmm. the baseball practice incident. So Steve is a he. Uh, but I think if if I hope this doesn't happen, but if the speaker were to be dislodged, I think they'd have to go with a whole new slate. In, in my opinion, mm -hmm. but who's going to want that yeah. job? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as as tough as uh, McCarthy has had it, he's not the first 
to have had this. His two Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan had a tough time, mm-hmm. and John Boehner John had Boehner. a time. So it's a yeah, it's a it's a very difficult seat to position to have. You know, in my experience, this <clears throat> this shutdown tactic is relatively new. The last fifteen or twenty years, it's, it's been tried a couple of times, and it's never ended in anything but total capitulation, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Well, Even the twenty eighteen, which was. Uh, because President Trump was upset because we had not appropriated more money for the wall. He asked for a certain amount for the wall initially. We appropriated to that number, and uh, and then he's decided he wanted more, and then he shut down Homeland Security. And uh, after uh, whatever days, what did you say, 50 days? Uh, 34, 40, 34 days. 34, 34 days, yeah, yeah. he finally said, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to get what I want. Let's move forward. And, and you're right. Capitulation on that part yeah. just doesn't lead to anything. And, you know, I, I've been there since 2000. I can't remember anything. I just remember Ted Cruz reading Sam I Am. Remember yeah. that? on the. But going back to John's point, uh, the first shutdown was uh, 1976, and there have been 20 since then. Have there really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. But I didn't. Re- I didn't remember any from the 2000. But, but most of them been one day right. or just a couple of days. Right. So it doesn't really get everybody's anybody's right. attention. Hey, off the shutdown now. I want to talk about your schedule for today, the places that you're going to be, and what you'll be doing today in Martinsburg. Well, we're going to the Martinsburg Initiative. Obviously, that was that's a great uh, coalition of to help with prevention of the drug issue. The numbers are still going up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know it deeply here in the Panhandle, and uh, so we're going to talk about that. I was able to get some. Congressional directed spending towards the Martinsburg Initiative. Then we're going to go over and tour Interwoven, which I hear is something to see and something quite needed in the panhandle as well. Some housing uh, different options. So that's good as we're growing here, as we always, as we have been throughout my tenure. And then we're going to go see CMC Steel, uh, which was a, a groundbreaking for um, a rebar um, production facility. Uh, several hundred jobs created there. And then we're hitting the road uh, back home. I'm going back home to Charleston tonight. And then hope you beat to, the rain. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. What is the deal with that? T- also, to, uh, tomorrow, which I am not going to be able to stay for at Spring Mills High School, we're doing our academy days, where we do the uh, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, uh, West Point Coast Guard, all that to encourage students. And we always get a good turnout in the Panhandle because we have a lot of alums, We've got a lot yeah, of yeah. great military folks. Yeah. So I would encourage young people, no matter how young they are, if they want to learn about these careers and learn about these schools to come out at Spring Mills. How does the nomination process work for your office in mm-hmm. regards to how many people you can nominate and how often for the academies? Well, I can. I have certain slots that I can... Uh, all, all students have to be qualified, first of all. I can't slot somebody in that's not qualified either through their uh, GPA, you know, their all-round application. Mm-hmm. But I can nominate... I believe it's four. I usually I can nominate ten in each academy every year, but slot wise, I think I get maybe four slots for a four year period in each one. So, but what I I encourage everybody to apply not just to me but also to the congressman and also to Senator Manchin because we're a small state. We can kind of maneuver around and work with each other to make sure we give them the best opportunities. Uh, I get press releases from your office, and I know that you've been busy securing funding for a variety of uh, different mm-hmm. sites around the state, including here in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, did you, was it for Blue Ridge uh, CTC that you recently got some funding too? We've been trying to help uh, a lot of the community colleges with nursing. There's nursing shortages. I just had an interesting conversation this morning with somebody who is a nurse who's traveling. Uh, She works for the state and she's doing some assessments in nursing homes. And I said, how's the nursing shortage? She said, it's it's just, I've never seen anything like it. And so uh, I'm not sure if that specific uh, congressional directed spend what, at Blue Ridge was for that specific, but I know we've been trying to help them with their nursing. We've also done some work with Shepherd uh, in terms of their agriculture uh, and, program. And also the cybersecurity. You got quite a bit of money for the cybersecurity. Cyber, yep. their chem labs, yeah. uh, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to direct your attention to the border. As you know, the drug problem in this country, and specifically fentanyl, is a major concern. It's shortening lifespans and destroying families. And there is much concern about how much of that is trafficked over the southern border. It is horrifying what's happening at the southern border, both the drug trafficking, but the human trafficking as well. You see it really, the numbers just going up, I think 9,700 day before yesterday. Uh, the, it's This administration is set to hit at the end of September the most ever in a fiscal year 
uh, illegal. They come in, uh, they're processed, and right back out into our country to wait seven to ten years to have their asylum claims heard. So what does that do to the drug trafficking? The drugs we believe are coming, fentanyl, uh, coming through the uh, uh, checkpoints. And, and it's not all getting caught. Some of it is. But when your di- manpower is diverted into the uh, 10,000 people a day, human trafficking, you don't have the manpower or the technologies to be able to disrupt the drug traffic sufficiently at the at the southern border. I, I went to Mexico. We talked with the uh, president of Mexico because they're bringing in chemicals from China. They're making the pills and making uh, producing a lot of it in Mexico, the cartels. And it's coming right up through our border and killing our killing our kids and our families and and all kinds of ways impacting us. Uh, you know, we've just got to number one stop the flow of those chemicals from China, uh, and we're trying to do it. But China is, as we know, not a not an honest broker here, and uh, the cartels are are uh, not only becoming billionaires on on drug trafficking; they're now trafficking so many people that they're, uh, that's actually become more profitable for them. Senator, there's a lot of facets to this, and I uh, applaud you and others addressing it. But one, but a, uh, a root cause is we do not have an effective immigration policy, and that has been talked about for years. Mm-hmm. Is, will we ever see one? A comprehensive immigration policy. You know, there have been a couple attempts, serious attempts, at a comprehensive uh uh, plan. There, there are the DACA's, which are the the children that were actually brought over very young age. Uh, they stay here and they're very Americanized. They go to our schools. They're working. They have no legal status, and that's that's uh, that's sort of a sweet spot where we could mm-hmm. all say, okay, we can we can see that that makes sense that they need to have a pathway to citizenship. I would agree with that. So you take that sweet stuff, but then what do you do with the 11 million? It's probably up to 15 million now that are here illegal that came as adults and and don't have a status either and i i I, for one don't think that shortening giving them the opportunities of american citizenships just because they jump the line so to speak illegally is is the direction we want to go that's where we get hung up but the president could do other things without congress acting he could do quicker asylum uh adjudications at the border look you you're claiming asylum your paperwork doesn't uh, doesn't bear this out. You're going back to uh, Venezuela. Uh, you could. Uh, we've been trying to work at the southern border of Mexico to try to stop the flow coming through there, but you have to have cooperation for the Mexican government, and that's spotty. There are uh, President Trump had a policy called "Remain in Mexico." You have your papers. You come in. Okay, great. You're gonna you're gonna see an asylum officer in six six to eight weeks. But guess what? You're gonna wait in Mexico. They don't want to do that. I mean, when the option is to go straight through and go into an American city, maybe where one of their relatives are. They been the the immigrants, or they been the yes. more progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, well, the the uh, President Biden discontinued that policy, mm, okay. and uh, that was effective because if you look at the line of illegal immigrants when the president put President Trump put that in, you could see the flow really go down. Uh, and it's it's discouraging. I saw at Eagle Pass a bunch of Venezuelans. I think uh, 2,500 to 3,000 came across, mm-hmm. and they gather under the bridge. And uh, our West Virginia National Guard went down, and the, uh, Governor Justice sent them down uh, to help with Operation Lone Star with the Texas National Guard and the Texas um, State Police. And I talked with them personally, and all to a to a person, they all said it is shocking to see and kids coming across dehydrated they're wading across the river um they were uh had guns pointed at them at at our guard members and they i think they were totally shocked by what they saw when it comes to the humanity humanitarian crisis down there i if you haven't if someone has not seen the terrain Mm -hmm. down in that part along the rio grande it's hard to comprehend how desolate and and difficult and, right. and treacherous that area is for these people who are coming across. It, it's and just to open to encourage the illegal entry is to encourage a lot of suffering on on their part. It's just it's a phenomenal. It just, it, it's a huge issue. Uh, yeah, it's a human tragedy. A lot of it's coming uh, from uh, South America, but 
uh, the guard told me they they found some Chinese citizens. Some terrorists have on the terrorist mm. watch lists are, have been uh, apprehended there. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the issues I really didn't realize was occurring. I mean, I've been down there like four times, but was that some of this is private property that's abutting the, on the on the Texas border. And you have private landowners sort of. Um, it's not a universal reaction as to how they let people in and off of their land, and that's part of the issue as well. Can we turn our attention yeah. to Ukraine and your support mm-hmm. of uh, continuing efforts to keep Ukraine free of uh, Russian intervention here? Well, I was in attendance at the old Senate chamber for President Zelensky yesterday, and it was an interesting give and take. He only spoke for about five minutes for and and did, it spoke um, extemporaneously. He didn't speak from notes. He did speak in English, and his English is good, but he did have an interpreter there uh, to help him on some difficult words and, and meanings. And then he took questions. And basically, his basic message is, if we don't stop Putin here, uh, if Putin is successful and wins, then he will go into Europe, into Poland, and into other areas uh, as his uh, empire building. He said that uh, the rest of the world is wait- watching, particularly China, as to what we will do, and uh, that this is about protecting freedom and um, coming to the aid of uh, a country that is uh, a democracy that has been illegally invaded by a brutal dictator. And I believe that's in our national interests, our, our United States national interests, to be strong here, to help our NATO partners and to help Ukraine push him back. It weakens uh, Putin's army all the time, every day. It weakens him. It shows the rest of the world that we're going to stand up for democracies. And it shows that um, that we have some of the best technology and weaponry that shows that we are the superpower that we claim to be and and so i think he made a very compelling case uh and i i believe that it is our best national interest to keep supporting ukraine why was he not invited to uh to speak before the house i think that was a decision obviously that was made by the speaker and uh, I don't know if he made the rounds over there. It was quite busy over there yesterday. Yeah, it was, I yeah. think he did. Uh, but this was a, a rare opportunity for us. I'm concerned that there's a faulty variable in the calculus about if uh, there's a key difference between Ukraine invading Ukraine and invading Poland, and that is NATO. Right. That Ukraine is not a NATO country. No. And I, it would require a special level of insanity for Putin to cross into NATO countries to to try this, don't you think? Well, I think he's he's search. I don't you know I don't want to get I can't get into the psyche of Putin because I don't think any of us understand. But I think he's trying to go back to recreate the USSR mm-hmm. and uh, and reclaim those countries that were part of that. Uh, so maybe it's not Poland. Maybe it's one of the smaller countries uh, that are on the border there. But uh, I, I I don't think that if he if he is able to be successful in Ukraine. Everybody says, okay, that'll be the end of the war. That won't be the end of the war. It's going to be step two for him. Well, we didn't do anything to stop him from right. taking Crimea. We didn't do anything to stop him in Georgia. And so now here he is in, in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. It's a very interesting debate. In fact, I have an idea that's going to be coming up in the next couple of hours here on the, on the Friday Five. Um, the difference between Ukraine and those semi-sovereign areas is unclear to me. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot mm-hmm. here, but but that's part of the debate that I, that, that I think has not been fully vocalized. Well, I think that uh, I, I think Zelensky made a case that he had previous to this invasion thought that he had an agreement with Putin that uh, they wouldn't that they would have a ceasefire and they would work some of these border issues out. And he said uh, retrospectively. What I've realized is he was buying time while he was uh, surging his army and getting his uh, getting his defenses. I think it sh- it has shown that because the supposition was well, four days in they're going to have all Ukraine because Ukraine can't fight this, and it showed number one the will of the Ukrainian people and their president, the world reaction also, but also the weakness of Putin's army in reality. Oh, we have all these weapons that can, you know, do supersonic or hypersonic and guided and all this. He, he, and, and now he's going to North Korea for help. Could, could I have? Oh, yeah. With the armored train. Yeah. Oh, that guy. Yeah. 
Could I have time to change? Yes. Uh, we, I think we do need to let her get on with her schedule, though, Bill. Yeah. It is 8.32, I'll, I'll and I don't to, want to make her late here. Okay. I'll try to shorten Very it, quick too. Quick. Yeah. Uh, recently, you and your son have endorsed justice uh, mm-hmm. in the race. Uh, according to Metro News and some of the others, it's caused a little bit of friction between you and Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, you have been friends with Senator Manchin, you and your family, for generations and generations. Mm-hmm. Is, is there anything to this so-called friction you know i read that article and i thought that sounds so dramatic i I would say uh i've known joe manchin since 1976 when believe it or not Mm -hmm. he came to my house and charlie's house Mm -hmm. to measure our house for carpet (laughs) <laughs> his, his dad sold carpet. My, our dads were buddies. We asked him about that, by the way, on the show. Did one you? Yeah. yeah. You know what he told me? I could lay that carpet today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joe. Joe and I are fine. I know. Okay, great, yeah, great. Good. We're fine. Good. We just but talked yesterday. Because your, uh, uh, your relationship, your rodenship, your respect for each other, I think serves not only the state very well, it serves the nation very well. So that's good. We've been in this a while. We yeah. understand yeah. each mm-hmm. other. Thank you very much for your time this morning. All right. Thanks. 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 Very much appreciate Now eat these tasty cakes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Senator Shelley Moore Capito, we appreciate uh, the effort uh, coming by here today. And got a chance to see Chris Strobel here uh, as well. Chris is the guy. He he tried to take your mic away from you at one time. Uh, we were we're trying to give it to him, but he won't he won't uh, he won't accept it. Yeah. Also, uh, Kelly Moore, thanks so much for helping to set this up too. Eight thirty 